right now from the lovely Dogleg Brewery in Fort Worth, Texas. It's time for You Can't Brew That on Television. Now here are your hosts, Brewmeisters Kyle and the Reverend Ryan Bono. Hey guys. What's going on, Rich? How you doing there in Houston, bud? Oh, I'm great down here in Houston. I'm glad to be finally on the air with you guys. It looks like everything's working, unless the uh, the beer spills. and Well, then it's all over. My mixer's <laughs> just waiting for it. How are you guys? Awesome. I'll tell you what, Fort Worth is beautiful, man. It's uh, it's, you know, it's, not it's gorgeous. So bad. The, the humidity finally dipped down to about seventy uh, percent. It was only ninety-four degrees today. It was, I guess that sure beats the humidity up there in Oklahoma City right now. But. <laughs> Golly, they're getting a monsoon up there. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone to you can't brew that on television. We are the internet television show talking about beer and brewing and the craft brew industry here in the state of Texas. I'm Reverend Ryan Bono, Kyle Lapointe. How are you doing? Doing good. Just uh, going to tell everybody that he- we're here once again to bridge the gap between Beer Snob and Frat Boy. We are, in fact, doing that. i got to say How- it for once. Awesome. <laughs> I-, I finally shut my trap long enough to let you say <laughs> one, of our te- one of our catchphrases. That's great. Mm-hmm. What are we doing tonight? What are we drinking? Tasting? beer. Oh, drinking beer. We're talking about German beer. Hope we're going to drink a German beer. Awesome. We're going to talk about our trivia, which is a trivia question about German beer. Uh, I'm sensing uh, some sort of a pattern here. Uh, I think it'll work out well, though. I think it's going to be a. I think this is going to be a fun episode. We're yep. we're really looking forward to it. And um, what are we tasting? We're starting off with some Varsteiner Dunkel. Varsteiner Dunkel. Uh, Varsteiner Dunkel. Dunkel is a darker flavor of uh, beer there in Germany. Uh, really, it's not too much heavier than, uh, say, a Pils or a Helles. But it's got a little more darker malt, uh, some more melanoidin flavors. You know, a lot of people that are just starting, like just starting to to branch out beyond the Miller Lights and the Budweisers of the world, they, they really get scared of dark beer. And and I, I think it's, I think, yeah, I think it's because their their first experiences with dark beer are, are going to be like something heavy and bitter. Um, maybe, and, and really this is garden variety when you've been drinking a lot of beer, but, but Guinness is a lot of times is people's first experience with dark beer and, and they're not, they don't really have the palate yet to handle it. And so they tend to shy away, but Barsteiner Donkel's got a nice, like lightly toasted flavor to yeah. it. You can smell the toastiness Absolutely. and what's called, uh, melanoidins. Uh, that's, it's a weird word, but basically what it means is kind of like a bread like feeling and taste. So if it, it if a beer tastes bready, tastes like you just uh, made your beer through a loaf of fresh cooked bread, that's melanoidins, and that's what this has, and it's really good. Uh, yeah, this, this is really is a classic beer, mm-hmm. and this is the the second highest selling beer from Germany's biggest brewery, and it's it sells that much for a reason. I mean, it's good, it's easy drinking. This is something that you could just drink an awful lot of on a summer afternoon. Interesting. Brings me to my trivia question. Let's hear some trivia. We're talking about how big this brewery is and how they uh, sell a lot of beers. They do sell a lot of beer. More outside of Germany than inside of Germany. So in this case, what we've got is – hold on. I'm being bugged by this. I'm going to mute it for a second. Ads by Google. What? Yeah, we we get tormented by the same ads that you guys get tormented by. So Well, anyway, they've got – they got a different range of beers that they sell in Germany than what they sell outside of Germany and export. What? Rich, do you want to go ahead and roll the, the trivia for us? Sure, we're up. Tonight's trivia question, Bono. What is the number one selling brand of German beer in Germany? Oh, wow. That is a tough one, and it's going to be a total stab in the dark <laughs> that I'm going to stew on until the end of the show because that... That'll work. I'll I've, guarantee I've got... you, uh, by the way, it's not Horsteiner or Mar- Barf-tiner no, I, I didn't think it would be. I, I've got a few ideas, and they're probably all wrong. Because I, oh, I really, was, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And when I saw it, I was like, really? Well, we'll give the audience twenty minutes or so to do the internet cheat. Okay, and uh, hopefully one of them will come up with it. All right. Well, uh, moving on, we've, we've we've got a quick bit of news for everyone that we're both really excited about. God, I think this really. This was uh, the Iron Mash last year. It was kind of really our launch. I don't know. I, I feel like you'd already been really involved in the scene. But it was definitely my launch into the scene of the craft brewing. Like, certainly the home brewing club. That's when yeah. I really started getting involved. Um, an event is coming up here in a few weeks. Kyle, do you have an exact date on that? 
Oh, you know, I probably do, but... Uh, Don't have it on you, but time, like end of July, something like that? It should be year. end of August. A end of August, okay. It's, it's an event, it's an annual event hosted by one of the brew clubs here in North Texas, and it's called Iron Mash. I don't know how many of you all out there have seen the Iron Chef, but Iron Mash is kind of a similar a similar idea. It follows kind of a similar guideline where each team shows up, and we're only allowed to bring yeast, and we're going to be given a big box of ingredients, and we have to make beer using only those ingredients. It's really a fun event because, yeah, it's like he said, it's like Iron Chef except with beer ingredients. So... You may have a great recipe for a dunkle. A dunkle. And you may get in there and they go, oh, man, look at all these ingredients they gave us. It's so close to what I can make as my dunkle, except I'm missing my Munich malt, which gives it all right. the flavor, all the character that causes that. So you, you're missing your key ingredient. you got to go on the fly and say, well, what kind of style can I make? I mean, uh, we don't have what we need to make the style we we make the best. So. And you and you have to specify your style when you're making the beer. It's not like normal beer competition where Kyle and I might make a beer. We might be shooting for sweet stout, and then it gets done, and we taste it, and we're like, ah, uh, that's more of a robust porter. That's a porter, yeah. That's that's definitely, we you know, missed the mark. You, you can't, you, you, you've got to call it on the spot, and you've got to nail it. August 1st. August 1st, there it is. And, and unlike the best damn beer, you, you are going to be graded on style, and... Mm -hmm. It's a it's a fun competition. Graded though. on style and how well you're graded how, on three things really. You're graded on how good that style actually is. Yeah. Then you're graded on how well you used the secret ingredient or whatever special ingredient you used to make that a flavor in the beer. And then you're judged by the two the combination where okay, well now you put this flavor in this beer. You did that really well. It's really strong. Now you did a really good basic style of beer. But is it good? <laughs> and and let's, and let's talk for a second. You, you mentioned the special ingredient. Let's right. talk for a second about the special ingredient. Okay. When you sign up, when you show up, and you're given your, your big box of goodies, uh, among them are going to be four, I believe, special ingredients. And one of those must you be used in its entirety. And these ingredients are not things that are necessarily always found in beer. Last year, for instance, we were given lemongrass, which is an herb, Yep. Kind of like the name sounds, tastes a little bit lemony. We were given anise seed, really grassy, very grassy. We were given anise seed, which of course is is what licorice, licorice. is made from. We were given um, cranberries, cranberries, which is what Kyle and I went and used. What most of people use. What most people use, and we learned our lesson on that. Yeah. And we were given serrano peppers, which a, only a handful of teams used, and those and beers. Surprising were very unique. Yeah, and surprisingly, one of those was, uh, was, the, was the, the winner. winner. The overall, the best in show. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I like hot stuff, and that was too hot for me to be able to even taste the base style. Yeah, I don't, so I don't like hot stuff, and so I felt like my mouth was on. But like, I poured like maybe that yeah. much, and, and I walked around with it for the rest of the night. Just like I would take a sip, and then like, like, I taste it with another beer. I can't get rid of this. I've got to drink the whole beer. But yeah. So, so you know, any, anybody here in the Dallas Fort Worth area? Definitely come out for that. Like even I had I had some buddies from work, and I think Kyle had some friends just yep. come out and say hi. Yeah, it's a and it it's it like happens the, at RAR at, at the RAR brewery in the so, backyard of RAR. Basically, it's right in the heat of summer in Texas, so people have tents. They bring out kegs of beer. They bring out their own home brews. It's just a big party. There's usually 25 teams, and so that's two to four brewers per team. And oh, you're talking 100 home brewers there doing their thing. And trying to brew in this ridiculous heat, it's a lot of fun. It's yeah, it was. I have a feeling this year's gonna be brutal. Last year, I think it was like ninety-eight. Yeah, but uh, on I, the I, back on the tarmac that is their asphalt parking lot, I bet it was. It, a good it was easily pushing one one ten. So then we, this, year, yeah, this year, this year, this year's gonna be ugly with the global warming as bad as it's been. You no, know, global warming finally hit. Yeah, I've been waiting for it. It, yeah. it was a rough winter, but it, it hit us like, like a ton of bricks. Every episode, Kyle, that's nice. Every episode. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't mention it last episode. I don't know. I probably did. I, I think I uh, subliminally SOS'd the global warming with my eyes. Maybe we could go back and watch the last episode. Mm -hmm. you can on, see it. We can watch the rerun online, but watching reruns is going to get easier soon. Rich, do you want to talk about that, or do you want us to mention it? Sure, I'll talk my way through it, because I'm the Let's tech hear. nerd. Um, we're going to start podcasting. So, 
kind of like we're doing now, but we're going to have this available for podcasts. So if you're an iTunes user or something of that nature, what? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you'll be able to subscribe through iTunes or whatever pod catching client you use. And if I'm doing my job correctly, which, you know, 50% chance, the stuff will come to you automatically in the background and you can take it to work on your little iPhone or whatnot. And, and, and Rich, will those reruns be commercial free? At the moment, they're commercial free. We'll see how much bandwidth you guys use up. But uh, <laughs> yeah, they are edited without commercials. So it's a clean viewing experience. The live stream's nice on the fly if you don't feel like downloading and all that stuff. But if you got a while, they're about 75 to 100 megabit, megabyte files. Cool. Pulls down quickly. Full video, full audio. Nice. And it looks perfect on your little iPod screen. Awesome. Well, well I, I look, I look forward to that. I think that's going to make the rerun watching experience a lot more enjoyable. I will. I enjoy uh, hearing myself talk. I wonder if I will uh, be able to talk to myself during the episode and add Dude, banter to it. That would be great. Yeah. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe that's something we should bring to the table one of these days. It's a good idea. A, a we can have a show where we scenes. just replay ourselves and talk to and ourselves. And talk to ourselves. I love that idea. All right. Well, well, Superimpose you as like a little devil and angel over your shoulders. <laughs> that, uh, Mark, write that down, Rich. That might be a fun April 1st episode for next year. Awesome. All right. Let's actually discuss tonight's topic because I know I'm excited about it. Guys, we could talk about this for hours. Like, literally, we started doing research, barely scratched the surface, found hours of content oh, yeah. of, of which we just sort of gleaned uh, just a, a few tiny morsels of information to share with you guys tonight. And... What we're talking about is is we're going to sort of give uh, like a brief overview, very, very broad strokes overview of German beer and German brewing, a little bit of the German his- German brewing history. Germans probably have been brewing since about 1000 BC, maybe 1200 BC, but, but like direct evidence of German brewing has been found dating to roughly 800 BC. And I think that's when the, uh, the German family Hasselhoff, Came around the, the Hasselhoff. The Hasselhoff. Yeah, Hasselhoff. You have to yeah. make sure you pronounce that right. Okay. So the Hasselhoff family was probably jer- brewing back in the uh, 1000 BC ish right. time frame, and brewing was was good. It, it was very primitive. They it, it was really sort of attributed to magic and, and kind of mysticism. All they knew was that they they put this stuff together and boiled it and let it sit out for a few weeks. When and, are we doing the magic episode? Magic, That's the only that. part I've never understood about the whole process, is when you do the magic. We, we did the magic episode. I made it disappear. Well, did, and speaking of magic, though, uh, they actually used to keep a stick yes. from a fermented, epi- uh, from a fermented uh, batch of beer. So one that was just crossing and fermenting, they would take a stick and stir it in there. And, and basically what would happen is it would grab a hold of a bunch of the yeast. And the next time they would brew a beer, and they'd cool it down. Then they'd put that magic stick into the next beer. That's always uh, something that I thought was really cool. That's pretty much how they brewed beer from 1000 BC, like you said, till 1600 BC or 1700, whenever they started to actually do research on yeast and be able to cultivate future batches or cross in their beers, where they, yeah. they would take the cross and directly off the top. And and the Ro- the Romans arrived on the scene uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 63 to uh, to 70 BC, somewhere around then, and the Romans. Were, they were big wine snobs. They were big wine drinkers. And anybody who's ever watched Gladiator or anybody who knows anything about history knows which that. Which is pretty much two in the same there. Which, yeah, basically. I mean, if you've watched Gladiator, you obviously know a lot yeah, about Yeah, very big history buff. And so the, the Germans were barbarians. And the, the Romans viewed were. beer kind of, kind of the same way they viewed the Germans as definitely below them. But nonetheless, Julius Caesar, and this is the, some of the stuff we knew and some of the stuff I, I was fascinated by. Julius Caesar is accredited with introducing brewing to the British Isles sometime, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 B.C. So even though they really looked down on it, they, they still introduced the Brits to it. And I, I guess they thought that the Brits were barbarians and the Germans were barbarians. So they would, oh, we're getting another commercial. So they would share the, the barbaric brewing tactics. Well, you with, know, in the end... It was considered the plebeian way to make Absolutely. water safe. Yeah. So, yeah, they they wouldn't drink it themselves because they were too ritzy, and they got to drink the stuff made out of fruit that tasted a lot sweeter. And let's be honest, like the way you're talking about making beer, the yeast got in the beer 
but almost without a doubt, almost every beer that was ever made had bacterial infections. So they were going to taste like Band-Aids half the time. I mean, it was going to be some pretty yeah, bad stuff. It was, was going to be some ugly stuff. But and it, so it, it probably was a very barbaric drink at the time. Yeah, and depending on if they made it by spitting in the cauldron or if they made it by the magic stick, you know, it, it could change things quite a bit. And and frankly, though, that didn't keep the, the Romans from eventually becoming enamored with beer. And, and they took to it, and they started brewing it. And that's when the monks got involved, actually. like every, Usually monastic brewing is, is attributed to Belgium now because they're the ones who really perfected it. They moved there eventually during yeah, the they, wars. Yeah, they moved there eventually during the wars, but monastic brewing began in Germany. And, and just like with, with many things that, that we are, are a part of in, in society today, the monks really, like I don't want to say that they saved brewing, but, but they certainly propelled it. Because the monks, the nuns, the priests, they were all educated people, and they took a very scientific approach to brewing. And it was German monasteries that started using hops. Every, everybody loves beers that are triple hopped. I yeah, know that there's a beer hopped. out there that's and triple that's really hopped. Good. Very good. And I've heard that most of the uh, monks, although quite primitive, mind you, were using Excel 1697, I believe it was. Yeah, Excel 1697. Bill, Bill Gates numbers. was... He didn't quite own the whole market back right. then. I think he was still splitting time. Maybe it was Lotus. With Lotus, yeah, yeah that's what I was going to say. Lotus. Still splitting time with Lotus. So the monks, armed with Excel 1697, <laughs> moved moved forward, and they really pushed the craft, and they started selling their beers, and that's when the feudal lords there in, in Germany started catching on to the fact that you could sell beer. You can make beer good. Yeah, exactly. You can make Weird. beer good. So the feudal, the, the German lords started making it, and they started selling it, and that's when the need for purity laws came about, because beer, people were making beer sort of every which way, they were cutting corners, and people people wanted to rescue the crack, they, they were really... Oh awesome. god, that is awful. Yeah, they that, they exactly. some of those. That's, that's what some of the lords, I think that was a direct quote from a German feudal uh, magistrate there. You know, some people were using sugar and random other things. Maybe not sugar exactly, but... Twigs and berries and... Different plants oh, that they could get, like, to get a little sugar from that may have caused off flavors. They'd do whatever to make it cheaper so that they could make more money. Because at that time, most beer was being sold for the same amount. You know, you, you went and bought a beer, it was $1 amount. that you, you couldn't go over there and say, my beer's of a higher quality, so I want to sell it for more because... It was pretty well regulated throughout most of the feudal lord systems. And uh, you have some information, right? I, I do, actually. Um, we're going to get to a very famous purity law here in just a minute. But when I was doing show research, I, I stumbled upon some some older purity laws from, from before they started, from before there, there was a national purity law. The the states or municipalities or, or even the, like, the lords themselves who had their own land, they would make their own purity laws. For instance, one of them said that um, no burger, and a burger is a name for somebody who lived in, in a burg, no burger or counselor may brew more than two beers per year, nor may he make half a brew, nor may he mill less or more than three boxes of milk to brew with. Only on Wednesday evening, and not before the beer bell is rung, may, may he start a fire under the mash tun and start brewing. And so this thou is example. Brew two batches of beer. That's a year. what I thought. Thou shalt not brew one unless thou art in the process of proceeding to two. If three beers is too many, and four is just crazy. Five is a write out. <laughs> and so, like, and and here's another one that anyone who breaks an innkeeper's beer mug or runs away without paying will pay a penalty, or he has to leave town. Mm -hmm. And anyone who buys hops may not touch the measuring jar until the vendor has filled it and has removed his hand from it. So here we have just a few examples of some of the silly local laws that were passed, but these are very important. They do. Because they, they, these, they, they paved the way. For... They paved the way for the... And I, I, both of us butcher this. It's really fun to try to say, though. The Reinheitsgebot. That's pretty good. Reinheitsgebot. I can't even try it. Reinheitsgebot. My, my it German, has to sound like you're really hawking a loop. Yeah, my, my German great-grandmother would be very upset right now. Uh, the the Reinheitsgebot, which we will, I guess, refer to as the German purity law. and We will English up. 
Kyle, tell us about the German purity law, the Reinhardtsebolt. Now, German purity law was came around to get rid of all these people that were trying to use adjuncts and cheap stuff and basically make their beers inferior. It really, that and the people that had good ideas, it was a stifling law is really what it was intended for, to make all beer taste the same. And although that's good and bad in some ways, they ended up making some pretty darn good beer, but and it was very similar in style for a long time. I, I, think, I think a really classic example of the fact that you can't hold back the market because what the German purity law stated is that you're only allowed to have three ingredients in your beers. And that uh, was before they knew that yeast was what technically yeast was. an ingredient. Right. So the three ingredients they allowed were water, malted barley, and hops. And so with only those three ingredients, technically four if you include yeast, that, like, that was all you were allowed to use for beer under German law. But... And before they had the uh, hops edition, actually, more when they had state laws and everything going for uh, purity laws, grit was grit. Yeah, was more common than hops. I always, they put, a, always, put, a, a, always put a Scottish slang on it. Like, grit. Yeah. grit. Grit. Give me some grit. <laughs> so, hey, yeah, I'm I mean, sorry. Go was, ahead. No, I was just saying, that's more of a – that was the popular – Bittering agent, uh, as opposed to hops. That, that was actually uh, a trivia question. Yeah, it really was. Gushed. I've drank since then, though. Well, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and so uh, you know, once again, the the hops. You, do you, I wonder if the Groot and the hops, like, do you think they were competing agents until the um, purity law? Basically, uh, the the only reason that Groot lasted as long as it did because it didn't taste nearly as good as the hops beers, right? And it didn't last as long and it was more expensive, was because a specific feudal lord that had tons of land and tons of power had a huge tax, and he had that law. So, so to so use guys, it, you had so, to buy it from him, you had to pay the taxes to him, and you had to use it by law. So, yeah, I mean, it was a pretty good racket that guy had going. And when studying beer history, I think one of the things we learn is that some things never change. Yeah. <laughs> oh, beer history in itself is so far shaped by bad laws and taxes it's just crazy and, and, and actually i believe this is rich asking where was the stuff in my history classes ever since really getting into the beer thing rich this is one thing that has really irked me is that beer is so closely intertwined with with history in general and very specifically with the history of this country and we never heard a thing about it in history class, and I, I think all that stuff was written out probably during Prohibition. And, and I, I think you're right about that because yeah, it definitely we hear about mentioning. Yeah, it, exactly. And you, you think that uh, uh, you know, I mean, we hear about Prohibition when we're in uh, when we're in class and we're going through these history portions. That's a huge chunk of history, but it basically, you know, they write it up as it was a failed. Uh, you know, government type regulation on right. human behavior, but they don't talk about all the far reaching effects that it had, all the economies that it ruined, and the reason why the thing failed. Because, in general, if you stop the general public from doing something that's damaging to themselves and that's damaging uh, you know, to the economy in, in general, then it will last, whether it, its intentions are, are good or bad. But in this case, it was something that the people that were working on farms to make the materials to make beer people that were having the beer beer was a uh, beer would, was considered something that wouldn't even get you drunk back in the day yeah exactly. <laughs> you couldn't get drunk unless you were having whiskey That's, and i very, very upsetting i yeah, uh, and, and i'd hate to see what the difference was drunk back then and drunk now because yeah. really cuz really when, really when the when the puritans for instance came to this country they really pushed beer. One of the first things they built in Plymouth yep. was a brewery. And, and the reason is because they viewed liquor as the source of drunkenness, and they viewed beer as the cure. Yeah. It, and so, I'm, you know, we're, we're, we're getting – we're totally getting on a tangent here, which, oh, yeah, which I love. Seriously, since I, – I think really since doing the show, I've become just fascinated by brewing history. And so you all are going to get an awful lot of it because I, I just think it's so amazing. And wine gives you a headache too, dude. And wine really gives you a headache, dude. Oh man, especially I, Mad Dog Twenty Twenty, which is wine a very, and champagne, very uh, fine wine. Make me like fight. It, right. it may be the weirdest thing, but you know, yeah, like that's supposed to be the civil drink that you're drinking, right? And 
Man, I, I get bow up. I want to. I just want to throw down with anybody when I drink wine. We should. We should do a. Uh, we should do a wine episode one of these days. You want to fight? Is that what you're telling yeah. me? <laughs> All right, that'll work. Whiskey and wine coming up soon. <laughs> so, you know, German beers. Sorry, we, we kind of got. <laughs> hey, we're, we're, we're back. Off, way off of here, and we're back here talking about German beer. We we've talked to you in the past, and I think this is something. Have we done a yeast episode yet? Not really. Yeah, we, we haven't done the yeast episode yet. So, just for those of you who don't know, those of you, those of you who aren't big time beer snobs like us, um, two primary forms of yeast: top fermenting and bottom fermenting. When you go to when you go to the store, when you go to the bar, and you you read that a beer is an ale, that's using top fermenting Unless yeast. Unless you're in Texas. Unless you're in Texas. And when you read that a beer is a lager, that is using, using bottom for many yeast. It starts at the bottom of the – it just like it sounds, it starts at the bottom of the carboy or, or the vessel, and it moves up, top fermenting, top down. And most – like the overwhelming majority of German beer is, is lagered, and, and lagered beers technically are – typically are smoother. They're, they're going to have, have a crisper flavor. You know, surely everybody's had a Bud Light or, or Budweiser. Those are lagers. They have smooth, crisp, crisp flavor. Uh, and they have more, they have like a sulfury type uh, and almost corn flavor to them when they're done to excess. Yeah, and definitely. So it's, it's, an, it's an odd departure from what would be an ale yeast that has more of a fruity nature or uh, it almost leaves like a, a, a more of a sugary content from what they're having. So you've got the ale, which tends to lead towards a sweeter taste, yeah. and the sweet is taken away by the lager yeast, by the lager so, fermenters. So upward, upwards of 80% of German beer that, that's produced in Germany is actually lager. In, in Germany, they, they like their crisper beers. That they like, they like to have a beer just ferment for a long period of time at a lower temperature. That's that's something that you're gonna see is really big in German brewing, despite and, the fact that it was created and institutionalized in Czechoslovakia. That's true. Funny you should mention Czechoslovakia, because the Czechs, che, the Czechs and the Irish, are are the only two countries that uh, have a higher per capita beer consumption. And that changes than, well higher than Germany. I and, guess I should. And Belgium ruled that roost till about I think like uh, early two thousands. Yeah, and then 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 what happened? Uh, then they like had too many kids or something. I don't no, know. I don't know. Now now they uh, don't start as much beer. They, they started going to see. They started going to see the Wiggles. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it sounds gross. So let's talk about what we learned tonight. First, I actually before we get to what we learned tonight, let's look at our trivia. All right, back to the trivia. Back to the tri- uh, Rich, could you please reread the trivia question? No. Yeah, it was, what is the number one selling brand of German beer in Germany? Uh, great. Thank There's you. There's Darkwing logging in. Darkwing. Mr. Shank is the last year's coordinator for uh, Iron Mash. So I don't Rude. know if you caught it at the beginning uh, well, of we, our we show. We were talking about Iron Mash. Talking about Iron show. Mash quite a bit and uh, gave some of the history and... Hopefully we'll be able to have him on as a guest here in the next couple of weeks. We are we are efforting. Yeah, and we'll we're, see. We're, we can lure him over with a beer. We're too. efforting a couple of other special guests, including Jen the Beer Goddess, who we would like to start having as a regular guest yep. to help you broaden your beer horizons. And there's one more special guest that I don't want to mention because it's it's such a such a far off thing. But uh, tonight's trivia question. It's Barney. It's. Oh, sorry. We weren't. That was supposed to be a secret. All right. Um, you asked what the largest producer is of be- German beer actually consumed in Germany. Yes. Guaranteed, I wouldn't guess it. I'm gonna go. I'm just gonna throw one out in the dark, I guess, and go with uh, Polliner. I'm gonna go with Polliner, oh. and I'm gonna be dead wrong. Who is the largest beer produ- German be- largest producer of German beer actually pr- consumed in Germany? I can't speak. I've had too much Varsteiner Dunkel. According to my five minutes of research, um, give it ten. Come on, I worked hard. Uh, it's am I Ettinger? Correct, Richard Ettinger. That's what I was going to say. Ettinger beer. Lost Rich. Oh no, I have it unmuted. Oh, oh, Ettinger. Is that maybe right, Richard? Yes. 
According to my pronunciation guide, my years of German speech, it's right. Oettinger. No, it's, I think Oettinger. it's Ettinger. Rich, have you been talking this whole time and we just haven't, like, have we been talking over you? I, I thought we were having a cheerful back and forth. <laughs> yes, it was cheerful. For yeah, us. it was great. We, we loved couldn't, it. We couldn't hear the back, so the fourth was awesome. Well, uh, but anyway, we've got. Uh, yeah, the from what I was reading, they don't advertise. They only make one beer, and it's just a pills. Darkwing can commit to July the fifth. You want? You want to set it up right now? Our when's our when's our break? I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Let's talk about that after the show because that might be a good time for like a finale. Okay. Um, good for that. Yeah, I, I think that would be good. So, um, what what did we learn tonight? We learned that Varsteiner is a nice, smooth drinking beer, con- so considering the fact that we have beer. sucked it down. Oh yeah. Uh, I like I didn't even realize, but we've gone through four bottles. And then we learned a, bit, a little bit about the Germans and what a bunch of barbarians they are. They yeah. love to drink lager. Yeah, and uh, we got through about. Uh, what, about maybe 2,000 years of their history, and then kind of left you at about the 1500s and said, uh, figure out the rest on your own? I think we should take it more rest of the way in September. Okay, we Come Oktoberfest time. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to do an episode on German beer during Oktoberfest time. Um, next week, you, you want to pick a beer we're going to taste next week real quick? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Darkwing, you got a suggestion for us Darkwing for next, su- beer, yeah, suggest next to, week's beer? Overlay wants us to write a book. Um, I'd be okay with that. I, I think we need a... Because th- if you guys could write, you'd be on internet television. Dude. Done once, and done. Once you're an internet television star, a book. <laughs> nice. Yes. I guess I typed a book. Is that good let's, enough for you, Dave? L- let's come up with next week's beer. During, next week's beer. In the, during post-show. Okay, we can do and, that. And uh, so next week... You know, we'll come up with topics and everything. We'd, we'd, we'd like cinder cone. All right. Next week, we're going to be tasting cinder cone. Can we even buy that here? I've never even heard uh, of it. I'm, I've never heard of it either. So, um, you know. I'm just worried I'm getting set up here. You know, we, we might be getting <laughs> holes. Oh, okay, we, we can get it holes. Then we're All right. good. Yeah, we're, we're good. So next week, we're going to be tasting cinder cone. Don't and know what that you is. Can, you can catch us next Monday at 7 p.m. right here on the Lone Star. And until then, always remember that we are not professionals. So please try this at home. Oh, God, that is awful.